Hi. Um, I've been asked uh, several times to do some um, scene breakdowns of, of various renders I've done um, over the last oh, goodness knows how many years. And the first one I'm going to start with today is this one, which uh, appears on my page at ArtStation. As you can see, uh, here it is at ArtStation, titled Fresh Water. Um, you'll immediately see that there is a, a large difference between what was originally rendered and uh, the way it appears at ArtStation. Uh, that's simply because when I flipped it, I, pre I preferred the composition the other way around. Uh, no other reason. I do this quite often. I um, have to be careful, though, of course, if there's any text in the scene, number plates on cars or signage, etc. In which case, that ends up uh, flipped. But in this particular instance, we were safe. This, uh, this particular scene all came about because I'd seen an advert for... Uh, this bundle of, uh, of items from big, medium, and small. Uh, they, they make a lot of, of kits um, containing all sorts of different themes. Um, but in particular, this one, the Grand Bazaar, appealed to me. Uh, when, they're, when they're first launched, they're not $250. They're generally around $100. And it's more than I generally spend. But um, these images just really spoke to me about um, the, the time I have spent in, in Arabic countries and and the, the feeling and the, the sensation of being there, especially the heat. Um, so yes, I got I got the kit and decided after I'd converted a few models from uh, OBJ into to VOB format for view uh, that I'd like to start rendering way before I haven't even finished um, unloading all the kit yet. Uh, and I bought this months ago. So the first things I unpacked were the camels, absolutely fantastic models. Uh, they're static, but obviously fully textured, etc. Um, so I did a, a few uh, prior renders, uh, just getting used to the um, the, the theme and, and to the models. Um, in particular, let's see, let's have a quick uh, look at uh, the other renders I, I did, some of the first ones. So there was uh, this grouping of, of uh, Arabs and, and camels with some of our plant factory uh, date palms. Um, fit together beautifully, I, I think. Um, and a couple of other images that I did using assets that I, I modeled uh, quite some time ago, but seemed to seemed appropriate. So this was the first big scene, I think uh, one could call it. So let's just have a look at what this is made up of. Very simple in many respects. Um, there are the figures, the camels and the people. So we have three camels, three people. Um, a bunch of uh, date palms along with some dead bushes. And of course the, uh, the water lily here. And then some landscape what i call landscape components so we have the terrain which is the uh, the shore of the oasis a cylinder which i've used basically to create a path down to the water so that i haven't got uh, too many rocks um you know so i could create a nice clear path and then the cube, which is the, the pond itself. Not a plane, a cube, so that you get some depth and some... Um, uh, it's much more interesting than just using a plane. And then uh, a global ecosystem. But let's, let's have a look at the interesting parts as I see them. Uh, one of the main parts and, and deciding factors was, was a material that I'd made um, previous... Uh, which I was looking for an excuse to use in any scene, testing it to see how it was going to work, which is this procedural uh, water material, which has what uh, we in England uh, call duckweed, you know, the little circular uh, floating leaves with some algae. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the water lily is from the plant factory and available through the plant catalogue. 
Um, and just so you can see how this procedural material is set up, I find it to be quite uh, interesting in terms of, of the layering system. So we started off with a, a just a plain uh, water material, which I have made green because, you know, water in full sun does tend to go green. Um, so I've looked at the, uh, the, the global transparency and, and more in, interestingly within the absorption and scattering, which is the translucency, the subsurface scattering kind of effects. So maximum uh, light penetration down to 54 centimeters. I didn't want to see the bottom. You know, I want it to be a bit, a little bit murky. I want it to be a little bit more interesting than just lovely clean water hence the reason for the title of the of the image in the end which was let's get back to where we were oh, gone too far story of my life just bear with me a second let's get back to that image which is here so fresh water question mark which of course if you've traveled through the desert and you're you're thirsty your camels won't mind uh this water but is it fresh enough for humans who knows i didn't drink it that's for sure i wouldn't drink it um but getting back to view so we have a base layer as i say which is is the water which i've set up um with a, a slightly different displacement pattern i didn't want the standard wave function you know because this is a small body of water so the ripples would be very very different let's just have a look at uh, how the ripples look so we've got some i think quite interesting ripples you know parallel the wind is blowing this way so the ripples are all going in the same direction and so that was a, an easy thing to set up in terms of um, displacement which is here and into there so that was just a Purling noises where I've extended the wavelength in X so that you get that um, extension, that stretching of the water. Um, and that was it as far as the as the displacement's concerned. But what, uh, what, have, what else have we done down here? We've done a bit of bump. Oh, yes, I remember what I did with the bump. Uh, this particular material I wanted to... Um, make it so it looked like there were raindrops on the water so if i um quickly set this up maybe on a on another cube so i can show you how the material the original material behaves so if i just drop a cube into the scene for the moment um which of course is under the water there she blows and we'll load that material And there it is. It's, um, I've just rendered a custom image to show it how it performs and what it does. But let's apply that image, that um, that material. And what we'll do is I will just make a quick layer and move that cube onto that layer. You'll see while I'm working that uh, some of the layers turn red. That's merely indicating the layer which you have used last. So that uh, if you do have many layers, it makes it easier to see. And I'm going to switch off all the other layers, make them invisible to render. Okay, so we just end up with a cube, which if I render that very quickly, I'll do it in preview and in the camera view, render. Just take a couple of seconds for that to render up, but you can see as it develops um, a couple of interesting things straight away. Remember, I talked about the um, translucency, the, the, the subsurface scattering. You can see quite nicely uh, how far the light is traveling down from the surface. Um, and I think it's quite easy to see the, the ripples on the surface. Now, I've done those as a bump as opposed to displacement because I didn't want to overload the displacement and slow down the render. I'm a very, very impatient renderer. If I've got a render, I want to get it done and move on to the next thing. Um, 
uh, it, basically, 95% of my renders are proof of concept. Um, and then, you know, once I've proved that things work, I move on to the next render. But in this particular instance, as you can see, that uh, ripple material is in the bump. And it also means turning it on and off is very easy because I just moved the... Um, the bump down to to zero or even lower oh no that's a duckweed sorry pond okay so if i move that down to zero it just won't appear at all uh, the other option is um, because of the way i've set it up what i try to do when i design a material is try to make it cover as many circumstances as possible especially something like water so i want it to be as flexible a, a uh, material as I p can possibly make it. So I build in uh, permutations and combinations within the material. So for instance, um, I've built in the ability to, to randomize the origin. If I expand that, you can see I've got it connected through to, um, sorry, the position, not the origin. Probably should be connected to the origin, to be honest, not the position, but hey-ho. Um, So yeah, what I've done here is I've taken uh, two images. Let's have a look at the preview. Uh, two, sorry, two arrangements of dots. I haven't used an image in this particular instance to uh, produce the, the the ripples. What I've done is I've added a filter. And what the filter is doing is determining what the cross section of the, the circle is. So from the center out, so I've drawn a waveform freehand, of course. <laughs> uh, speed is of the essence. I've drawn a waveform. So we, in the middle of the ripple is where the most intense um, differences, height differences, working out towards the edge where it becomes obviously into the to flat water. So what I've done is I've made two different sizes um, and added a blender so I can decide for myself how much of which one I want the most of. Great sentence, I know, how much of which one I want the most of. Uh, <laughs> so I can blend between the two different sizes. Uh, and obviously I've uh, published uh, this parameter to the front end, called it small to large ripples. And I've deliberately said small to large because of the way I've connected it. Yeah, input one, which is at the left-hand side of our slider. Input two, which is at the right-hand side. So intuitively, we work, well, I work anyway, from left to right. Um, so I can reduce the size of the ripples. I can go from small ripples to large ripples or a mixture of the two. And if I don't want them, as I say, I just make the bump zero. But I think, personally, um, that particular layer is working quite nicely. Let's have a look at the other layers, um, because they presented their own uh, unique issues. Let me um, switch this layer off. Just bear with me a sec. So as I said before, we've got uh, uh, two other um, types of, of texture going on, on in, within this one texture, which is uh, both the duckweed, the small round uh, floating leaves, and the algae. So let's look at those layers and how they contribute to the overall material. Let's have a look. Okay, so we'll start at the top. We'll go with the, the duckweed, which again is uh, procedural, which means... You know, we're not relying upon an image to produce all these little dots. Um, what we've got is, let's see where we started, round samples. Two-dimensional, two-dimensional simply because we don't need that third dimension. This is just a leaf floating on water, so the, the Z is irrelevant. I've reduced it down to one sample per cell, so I get a space in between each of the leaves, spread it out and had some random altitudes to break it up again, you know, in terms of height and, and different colors as much as anything else in the, um, in the material. 
Um, most importantly is where we work through and we start getting to the point where we get the alpha. Now the alpha is going to determine the um, transparency so that we get it solid where the leaves are and transparent so we can see the water. So it's a very simple uh, material in many respects. But again, all stemming from the same um, basic principle of trying to produce uh, a random duckweed effect. So I've got a, I've got some patchiness built in. Okay, and you can see by the purple again that I've uh, published that parameter to the front end. Color is quite simple. It's just a, a, a gray a green gradient. Nothing special. Uh, the most interesting parts are, are the round samples and the distribution, you know, the, the gaps between. So I've uh, built in again some parameters whereby I can make this more random. So I get a different pattern every time I press the random button, which again has been published to the front end. So I can adjust the amount of duckweed but I can also randomize the amount of duckweed. In this particular instance, it's a very natural product. So I wanted it to be scattered and distributed naturally. So by using a fractal to give us our uh, distribution, and obviously the round samples for the shape of the leaves, we end up with a situation where we, in, we gain the, um, the patchiness. And the next layer is the is blanket weed or algae. It's probably more like algae than blanket weed. But again, entirely procedural. You can tell I've given the two uh, same criteria, the two adjustable criteria. Whoops. Ooh, that went a little bit mental, but hey-ho. Um, uh, so this is adjusting where the blanket weed or the algae is going to appear, i.e. the depth of water. It, it appears in. So I've made it so it, it can appear either in shallow or deep water. It depends on how I've got it set up. But you can clearly see um, that, uh, yeah, it's appearing in shallow areas. So if I want it to appear out here, I've put an invisible terrain under the, well, I usually put a, an invisible terrain under the water. But here, I just wanted it to be at the most shallow parts. We'll look at the terrain in a second. Um, let me just close that down. And we'll have a look at the setup. Because what I discovered uh, quite fortuitously is that um, by using this particular function, the, the clumps function, um, we end up with an... Uh, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it gives an impression of depth. So we've got some clumps which appear to be very, uh, you know, on the surface of the water or above with a little bit of displacement. But it fades and looks like it's dropping down into the water. So it gives us a, a, a better illusion of the third dimension. You see down here, it's not as obvious as it is here it's not as strong as if it's dropping down into the water i discovered that quite by accident i think it works quite well hence the reason i did a, a quick tips and trips tricks tutorial easy for you to say um in the eon uh, youtube channel um Color again is just a gradient, and I've used the uh, the terrain fractal, reduced the scale of it so that I can get some uh, color breakup over a smaller area. So I don't again end up with a uniform color. Nature doesn't like uniformity, so we like to break up things. So we don't really need to worry about transparency per se, not in terms of, of making clumps. That's predetermined by the depth of the water so what we have there is a a pond water which i as i say i personally feel um is adjustable enough 
for a variety of different situations. It becomes a, a, a standard material that I save out and use time and time and time again. Maybe changing the colour of the water, maybe not using the algae or the duckweed. You know, it gives us flexibility when we're constructing a scene to have to, uh, materials that will cover a variety of instances. Let's have a quick look at the terrain. This is nothing clever, nothing clever at all. Um, just double click. Let's have a look at our terrain. Let's rotate it round because if I switch on uh, the scene, you can see that it's all taking place down here down in this particular section so all I've done is I've created a terrain um, very simple terrain using a, a, a simple fractal ignore the stack I just like pretty stacks <laughs> I like my functions to be nice and tidy uh, some aren't so tidy if they're very very complex um, but uh, then what I've ended up doing is once I've composed the scene, I went back in and did a little bit of hand sculpting so that I could dig out and emphasize where necessary um, to create the scene. So all I used was the paint tools and the um, raise and lower and inflate, you know, all of these tools to just very, very roughly doesn't have to be immaculate i'm not going to use this terrain for anything else it purely exists just for this one particular scene and you can see with the gray where the rectangle the cube of the water is and then the figures crouched and gathered around waiting to decide whether it's safe or not to to drink not a particularly clever terrain nice uh, it's nice to create one by sculpting uh, to make it suit our purposes for for a change but you can see how closely cropped it is that um, we didn't need anything big and clever and if we can avoid having to get into complex uh, modeling it's so much better for a quick turnaround especially when i was working in industry uh, the last thing i wanted was um, an illustration to take forever if i wanted to an illustration to take forever i'd have painted it by hand like i used to do um and then of course as i say we have the cylinder which is just affecting our distribution of the rocks and stones and this in terms of the um the distribution of the stones on the terrain um in particular uh, the cylinder will be affecting um the distribution there of the stones so we've got density there decay near foreign objects um depopulate below foreign objects as much as possible thinking in terms of um underneath the 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 camels which are standing um whereas the um the cylinder itself penetrates through the ground into the into the terrain below and therefore nothing can populate below it what's left oh yes painted ecosystem one of the problems i encountered whilst trying to um to do this was um getting the uh, bulrushes the the reeds just around the intersection between the water and the land um, there wasn't enough of a height difference between the water surface and, and the, the actual terrain to use the um, distribution. Let's have a look at this material. So the reeds, yeah, there what just wasn't enough uh, altitude differentiation between the, the water surface and where the sand was. There was enough so that I could get a pond edge but not so that I could narrow it down in terms of, of presence. And I remember I, I messed with that for far too long. I, I wasted far too much time trying to control it using the presence, when in the end, um, I, painting it by hand was so much more simple. It was quicker, it was easier. Um, you can see up here it extends originally i had a, a different frame around the picture i think it was uh, 
HD, what was that? 10, 1080 by something other than not 1080. Uh, let me just remind myself. Yeah, so um, TV, isn't it? 16.9, there we go. So it was something like 1920 by 1080 originally, but I decided I wanted to go with CinemaScope. One of my favourites. Cancel that. So yeah, um, uh, a global ecosystem, as it's called, or a painted ecosystem, turned out in the end to be the quickest and most simple way of getting these bull rushes in position. So at the end of that, we end up uh, with a scene which is composed. Um, oh yes, also on the terrain, I uh, used an ecosystem of rocks and sticks. Uh, the the disturbance in the in the texture um, was just done with bump, nothing clever. Uh, I think if uh, if I remember correctly, it's the grainy. Fractal. Let's have a look. Doop, 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 bump. Grainy fractal. Nothing clever. Not done any filters or anything. It, it, I applied it, rendered it, and decided it, it was enough to do the job. Again, don't waste time. If you don't need to waste time, are you going to gain anything by... Um, Excuse me whilst I argue with view here. No. Okay. Are we going to gain anything by spending hours making another ecosystem? Are we going to overload our system resources? We have to be very aware of this, this little number down here. Um, ecosystems can badly tax our system resources. And it's just not worth it. If, if it doesn't need to be modelled, if it doesn't need to be geometry... Um, fake it with a bump map. Nobody can tell the difference unless you look very, very closely. Um, put a few sticks, sticks and stones. <laughs> Some of my favourite things to distribute around an ecosystem. Break things up, make it look a little bit more naturalistic. I could have done more work with some smaller dry grasses, etc. But to be honest, it was really intended as a test just for these objects from uh, big medium small um and that's really the only reason the scene exists i don't know whether you found this of, of any use i hope you have don't be don't hesitate to get in touch if you want any more information i'm always happy to share what little knowledge i possess um it's always a pleasure to to be in touch with with the uh, you guys, because as I've said in other videos, without you, we don't exist. Um, so, you know, get in touch, interact. I miss customers. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.